Welcome to a really exciting series here on the Canary Islands. So, of course, those wonderful islands just off the African coast, but a part of Spain. We are looking at part six here, which is actually our second part in terms of the Tenerife Dios. You'll see at the bottom, we've already gone through the first one. If you haven't seen that video already, please do go back and have a look at it as we lead into our, our remaining Dios of Tenerife on this video. Let's rock and roll looking at the island of Tenerife again. Of course, remembering it produces a whopping six, nearly six out of 10 bottles of Canary Islands wine. Here we are looking closer again at the actual breakdown of the five DOs we find on Tenerife. So on the previous video, we looked at the Orotava Valley and then Tacaronte Agentejo. We're now going to go across to the uh, sort of northwest, mostly the west area of the Icodendote Esora DO. Really uh, quite an important area. Now it takes its name from the tribal territories of the Guanches, which of course were the Aboriginal inhabitants of the Canary Islands before the emergence of the Europeans in this area. The designation itself centers around the town of Ico de los Vinos, uh, and that's of course where the naming comes from, and is one of the most dynamic DOs in the region. It received its DO status in 1994. Now we've got lovely jagged coastlines, rich green vegetation, and that's as the land climbs steadily from the coast to the center of the island, which of course is dominated by Mount Diede. Uh, we know all about that. We've been going through that quite, uh, quite a lot in this series. There's a picture of it as well. So vineyards are at varying altitudes here on the slopes of Mount Tiede, although generally it's accepted that the best wines come from some of the higher elevations of up to around 1400 metres. Volcanic origin soils here, as you would expect, and we have Mediterranean based uh, conditions, though we still get the Alicios wind here or the trade winds which bring cooling effects and moistures from the sea. Uh, winters here can be fairly mild, mild to cold, but generally speaking it's quite typical Canary Island climate. Now <coughs> what have I picked in terms of grape varieties? Now once again these grapes can go in multiple areas but I'm going to feature two grape varieties here for Ico Dendorte Esora. First of all, talking about Gual, as you'll see here. This is otherwise known as Malvasia Fina. It's a very old variety from either the Douro or the Dao region in Portugal. It has a particularly quite high genetic diversity around the Douro. So there is a thought that it probably comes from that area. It's late budding and therefore not at risk from spring frosts, and it's actually fairly early ripening. It's also called Boal in Madeira, and it's called Gual here. So Malvasia, uh, Boal, Gual, as it's sort of traversed into the Atlantic. Quite vigorous, generally easy to grow, uh, and it's sometimes affected by things like a little bit of disease pressure or couleur, uh, and also severe water stress can be an issue with it as well. It was probably first brought to the Canary Islands by the Portuguese, most likely in the 16th century. And then Juan Jesus Mendes Severio discovered Joal on the island of El Hierro in the late 1990s. Uh, so that's really where it comes from. Now, it thrives at lower altitudes as it likes warmth. So typically you find this along with Mama Huelo towards the coastal areas of the Dios that it's found in like here in Icodon Dorte Esora. What else do we find here? The rather sexy, often called liquid gold Mama Huelo. So this variety is um, an old uh, Canary Island native. On El Hierro, listed just here, it's actually called 
Bermajuela. So that's where we think the name has come from, because also on El Hierro, there is an even rarer grape called Bermajuela Rosado, sometimes called Vermajuela, which is a bright pinkish red variety when ripe. And it's found by recent molecular studies that it's an actual ancestral form of the modern Marmajuelo. The historical literature on the grapes of Canary Islands mentions also a rubella colored, and that, that's from the Latin rubellus, meaning sort of reddish, rubescent. Uh, and that's a grape species accordingly named Vermilion, uh, which is thought to have come from the islands and the area in the southern part of Spain, that's Almanacar. So we can therefore theorize that Vermilion later becomes known as Vermajuela, which we were just mentioning. And because of the V and the B sound very, fairly similar, it might be that Vermajuela ends up becoming Bermajuela and then eventually becomes known as Mamajuelo uh, in the end of it. And that's probably because um, the Ma bit means sea, and it's a grape that likes to see. Uh, so it probably eventually was changed to being uh, called Mamajuelo, as it's a sea-loving grape variety. Are you still with me? Who knows? It's quite complex. What about uh, elsewise with this? So it can have relatively weak roots. Uh, and, and also quite a short lifespan, so it often needs replantation. Vines can also have pollination issues, so issues around couleur, and they can therefore develop to, uh, sorry, fail to fully develop. And that means that generally speaking, Mama Huelo is actually quite an uh, uneconomic grape variety to, uh, to grow. So, it's not found that much. We don't have much. It's probably something like 30, 40 hectares in the Canary Islands. And it is often classified as liquid gold. You'll find that in blends, it brings things like passion fruit, pineapple, and almost kind of an opulent floral character to it as well. 100% mamajuelos are often exotic and very warming. Some winemakers are harvesting mamajuelo a little earlier and giving it a little bit more exposure to secondary vinification processes like lees, for example. So that gives more texture, but balanced by some more freshness. I love these wines. They really are quite sumptuous, quite complex, creamier, uh, and quite lovely. And especially if they are harvested a bit earlier for a bit more salinity behind the wines. So do look out for these. And they also can age exceptionally, exceptionally well. So what are we looking out for here in terms of producers? Of course, uh, Vignatigo is a very important producer. So uh, I've mentioned about really the founding father of Vignatigo, and that is the one called Juan Jesus Mendes Silverio, a proud native of Tenerife and a fourth generation of growers on the island. Now, during the 25 years that he has overseen Bodegas Vinatigo, he has considerably increased the vineyard land, planting indigenous varieties according to site and climate. And that's focusing on almost extinct varieties like Baboso Negro, Vijarriego Negro, uh, but also the likes of Gual and uh, Mamajuelo. Uh, so quite exciting, really, about capturing this very, very small amount of history that's left and repropagating it. So more than 80 different varieties in the Canary Islands have now been identified, many due to the great extensive work of Juan Jesus, uh, often recovered from the island of El Pinar, and they have been uh, further propagated, for example. Now we have the new generation in place. He's in this picture. This is Jorge Mendez. He studied viticulture in Madrid, now in charge of the viticulture. Uh, and uh, we are talking about sustainability being a focus here, organic, and in fact, even some influences of biodynamic. Around 15 hectares are cultivated from around 15 different sites. The facility which we're standing in front of here is this wonderful sort of um, uh, rounded tower 
built from local stone, very impressive. And it goes very much uh, subterranean with some really great uh, vineyard uh, facilities, which are ever expanding here as well. So please do look out for for Vignatigo. Really, really quite important. Now we're coming across to the eastern side of the island where we're looking at the Val de Huimar. So the Val de Huimar was actually established in 1996. It named, it's found around the town of the same name, so Huimar, and it's around quite a fertile valley. It lies just to the south of Santa Cruz, which of course is the island's capital city. And it's uh, um, important in terms of being quite located close to Santa Cruz. So what do we find here in this area? So we find in the valley of Huimar kind of a dry and quite um, sporadic landscape uh, that goes from the coast all the way up to, of course, Mount Tiede. Uh, and it can rise up to around 2,000 meters in terms of the landscape of the Val de Huimar, but vines don't tend to get that high. We'll find terraces for both viticulture and horticulture here, carved into the wonderfully rippling uh, terrain you find here. You'll see pine trees dotted around the region, particularly at higher altitudes. And then the distinctive black volcanic sand that unfolds from the slopes towards the sea and then going up towards places like Huima and also Arafo as well. Um, so we are in the slopes of the uh, Pico de la Tierra, so the Mount Tierra area. Uh, vineyards are up to around 1500 meters, making them some of the most highest vineyards in the whole of Europe. Uh, but most of the vineyards are found at about seven to eight hundred meters, where the effects of the Mediterranean climate, albeit in an Atlantic setting, are mild and the soil is a vine favoring mix of volcanic matter and clay. At lower altitudes, expect things like Gual and Mamajuelo, and then the Listans generally at the more northerly latitudes. Now, one of the most impressive winemakers here is Juan Francisco Farina Perez. Uh, I'll talk about him a little bit. But generally in the Val de Huima, you'll find white wines accounting for most of the production. Uh, so Listan Blanco, of course, is pretty much around nearly two thirds of plantations. Uh, the examples are quite distinctive, quite fresh. And under the DO's regulations, Listan Blanco can also be used to make a local espumoso, a sparkling wine. Um, you'll find dry and off dry and even sort of semi-sweet expressions being made, barrel aged whites. Lista Negro is the predominant red grape variety, but also Negramol, uh, also things like Moscatel Negro being used in blends here as well. The Val de Huima wines range from young and fruity, uh, all the way up to more sort of serious barrel fermented expressions. Los Loros uh, is uh, Juan Francisco Farina Perez's wines, as you can see just here. Wonderful character, charismatic, gregarious, and his winery is located next to the cooperative that he used to work for before breaking away to make his own wine. So you drive up a little very sort of winding road and next door is the cooperative and behind it is his very emerging winery. Uh, so quite wonderful. The winery itself, uh, his family used to own one of the local restaurants that made wine just to feed the restaurant. Uh, the restaurant closed down to focus really, really purely on the wine production. Uh, and that's, of course, what we get today. Fantastic wines like the Alistan Blanco de Canarias, but also look out for blends where Albio Criollo is being used and things like Boal uh, or Boal and um, Mama Juelo. So really lovely wines. Experimental wines being made here as well. Very low alcohol reds at about 10 or 11 percent. And then also whites that have floor to them. So quite fascinating for sure. Our last D.O. is D.O. Abona. So from the 1950s through to the late 1980s, 
a handful of cooperatives here gave the industry of this DO some momentum. Uh, but it's been under the banner of the DO itself, which was uh, 1996 awarded, that we have seen really uh, impressive steps towards the local quality uh, being increased and the infrastructure. It's the southern part of the island you can see there. So uh, we find that we are around places like Fosnia, Arico, Granadilla de, de Abona on the coast, Miguel de Abona, Aron, Edeje, uh, and uh, highest of all, Villaro de Chazna. There are 18 registered bodegas here, uh, but the vast majority of production is by three cooperatives, and nearly all of Abona's wines are locally consumed. There's not really much exported. Um, now, the area here is an area which is extremely rugged, uh, semi-arid, desert-like, uh, and it can dramatically increase in altitude, of course, as you go towards Mount Tiede in the northern part of the DO, above a thousand meters. You'll have terrace vineyards being carved into steep cliffs, sculpted by volcanic eruptions and the steady trade winds that come from the north and the west. So there's a lot of microclimates to be found here. I mean, if you've ever flown into the southern part of the island, the southern airport, you'll know that it's quite arid and in fact very much decimated by the African wind, very, very dry and warm wind. Um, so most vineyards are found towards Mount Tiede. We will ha have an area specifically in this kind of foothills called the Medellinas. Uh, and the Medellinas is kind of like a, an elevated area, 300 to 1800 meters, creating some of the highest vineyards in Europe. Uh, the picture you'll see here is of Bodegas Combres de Abona. That's one of their wines, which in fact is a white afrutado, a little bit of sugar to it. And there's another producer here, um, which is Vera de la Fuente, which makes quite powerful expressions, fruit bombs produced from the likes of Baboso Negro. But this bodega you see here is significant. Founded in 1989, it's by, by some distance, by some margin, the biggest producer in Abona. Uh, it has pretty much half of the region's bottled wine each year. 400 members bring in grapes from around 900 hectares. Uh, so you are looking at significant production with this one. Uh, about 98% of what they make is also signed, sold in the Canary Islands, so which is quite, uh, quite crazy. And most of it actually uh, significantly direct to consumer, uh, which is quite an interest. Well, there you go for that second part of the DOs. Please do join me for the final part where we look at Lanzarote and the other DOs across the archipelago. Thank you very much. Ciao for now. Goodbye.